welcome back to our course on scanning electron ion probe microscopy. Uh, in our last class or last lecture, we were discussing on energy dispersive X-ray analysis that is used to measure the elemental composition in an SEM. Uh, we left here in last lecture uh, while discussing the detector. A detector is used to detect the X-rays. We have a PIN silicon detector and this silicon is docked with lithium to reduce the conductivity. Moreover, this detector is placed at a lower temperature 77 Kelvin so that its conductivity will be less uh, and also in addition to that uh, uh, this uh, PI injunction is reversed biased so that we can uh, separate out the electron holes generated due to incident X-ray and collect the uh, current generated uh, in the detector and that current is amplified with a field effect transistor and then it is converted to voltage output that is what we will see here. Uh, the field effect transistor is used to convert the charge or the current comes uh, from the detector x-ray detectors and it first converted to voltage and voltage is uh, deposited to a capacitor. So, this is a uh, charge to voltage converter, then it will be deposited to a capacitor and the charge uh, this uh, voltage steps, uh, the voltage steps as you see here is proportional to the incident x-ray energy. So, by knowing in the voltage steps, we would able to know what is the energy of the x-rays falling onto the detector and in this process. Uh, we would able to calculate the energy of X-rays. Then, then we have a, a cryostats as I mentioned before, uh, the detected charge signals are very small in the detector. Therefore, they must be separated from the electronic noise to, re to reduce the noise the cryostat is used. Uh, then the, the, we have a pulse processor the voltage steps that we obtained from the uh, field effect transistor FET uh, that is transferred to voltage pulse after reducing the noise and the time over which, uh, over which the waveform is average is called process time. This is called process time and here you can see process time is small, process time is small, here process time is large. By increasing the process time, we could in improve the resolution then increasing the process time you can see that there is a uh, waveform with a smaller flow width of maximum therefore resolution will be higher but if we increase the process time then fewer events will be measured because when we process the signal that time we will not collect the additional signals received by the detector so fewer signals will be measured if the process time is longer. If the process time is smaller, then quickly next we can again receiving the signal coming from the uh, detector and that the intensity, intensity will be much higher with a lower resolution. So, these two parameters is very important in the EDX analysis that is called process time and the Mm, that is the process time and the um, process time which is uh, um, uh, related to the output rate and input rate. In particular, uh, output rate is our uh, acquisition time or acquisition uh, uh, process and input is the how much, uh, how much the charge is received by the detector. So, th that is related to a term called dead time. Dead time is the duration when pulses are not measured in order to process the pulse. The pulses are continuously coming from the detector to the field effect transistor 
and during the process time we are not receiving the pulses that fewer events are measured and in this process we will decrease the output rate as you see here in this graph uh, when the process time is longer then we have a better resol resolution of 142 electron volt as the process time is decreases decreases output rate count is increases on the other hand resolution decreases this resolution value decreases from 192 resolution is better with 142 electron volts here resolution will be poor poor resolution by decreasing the process time so the process time plays an important role in controlling the resolution and, and also the signal output so there is a optimum so that is what called dead time the dead time of 30 to um, 60 percent will maximum maximize the output that's mostly it is chosen in a manner that we have a dead time of 30 to 60 percent percent then we have a multi channel analy analyzer uh, which takes the data from, from pulse processor and display as a histogram of the intensity counts versus voltage and then from there we we get a we get a um, signal uh, or spectra here so the MC, uh, multi channel analyzer takes the peak height at each voltage pulse because multi there are several channels and depending upon the energy different channels will be activated and it will uh, then detect or give the signal and pro produce the spectra uh, with uh, particular uh, energy with a particular channel and this count is registered against each energy level. So, here is a um, EDX sp um, spectra, here is EDX spectra of two samples, one is uh, zinc nano walls and another is uh, zinc nano pillars. As you see here, uh, we have uh, in the x axis energy we have x axis energy. So, uh, almost uh, all the um, atoms in the periodic table uh, above um, bor boron onwards will produce at least one x-ray line between 0 to 10 keV and between taking the uh, in this energy range we would able to tell which atom present in our specimen and how much percentage. In this particular cases as you see it is a zinc oxide in the first cases this is a nano wall cases we could see oxygen zinc chlorine k alpha chlorine is also there and also zinc k alpha zinc k alpha x-ray line will be higher because it is in the it is closer to the nucleus compared to the l alpha and in this cases in case of nano pillar we do not see chlorine chlorine is not present here only the zinc and oxygen is there so though both are zinc oxide sample in one cases we could see the chlorine in other cases there is no chlorine is there it indicates that chlorine impurities is playing a role here in the formation of two dimensional structure as compared to the formation of the one dimensional structure that is nano pillars ok. So, that this peak height the peak height in the uh, spectra is not directly related to the composition there are other factors to be taken into consideration. So, for example, here as you see the zinc peak is quite large compared to oxygen, but that does not mean that zinc concentration is much higher than oxygen. Here in the zinc oxide the atomic ratio is 1 is to 1. So, the other factors is taken into consideration in the calculation of the composition. So, it is uh, difficult to um, normally the composition is calculated uh, as compared to the standard one in the standard uh, with the standard sample still uh, it is difficult to determine the concentration of an element of a, in the unknown specimen simply from the x-ray intensity of the standard specimen uh, by comparing with the standard specimen we can we, we cannot just take intensity of the x-rays that we obtain from our sample to the standard specimen because sample can have different environments and different effects could also play the role. In particular, there is three effects one that is called Zapf effect. Uh, 
z effect means the occurrence of the characteristic x rays varies with atomic number. So, atomic number will play in the play a role into it then a effect that is the self absorption Sa certain uh, materials will undergo self absorption until it escapes to the vacuum. So, that is therefore, the a effect and the f effect that is the fluorescence effect uh, a certain characteristic x-ray is subjected to fluorescence excitation by other x-rays that I was discussing with a brass sample with zinc and copper. So, due to those reason the quantitative analysis is little complicated, but the, con uh, the quantitative calculation is done C a of anode sample is the, the intensity of our sample unknown sample divided by the standard sample. Unknown sample means we, we must know that means what is uh, from the from the peak position we will know which element is present and how much intensity and what should be for example in pre previous cases we have a zinc we know uh, for example uh, in the previous cases we have a zinc and oxygen we know the at uh, the energy position at which zinc should come once peaks comes there then it can be uh, confirm that presence of zinc. Now, the zinc intensity zinc peak intensity will be compared with the standard of zinc while taking consideration of the atomic number taking the consideration of atomic number and absorption effect and fluorescence effect of the zinc the unknown sample or the zinc composition of the sample will be determined. So, in this way we measure, uh, measure the quantitative measure the quantitative uh, we measure the elemental composition quantitatively in the specimen. We can also do the mapping x-ray mapping and this is an example of zinc oxide nano belt. So, what you see here what you see here is that uh, these are some the lines bright lines this is a CM image the bright lines is due to the nano belt and the green color is the elemental mapping of the zinc k alpha wherever you see the green green color that means the presence of zinc and in the C 1 you see the red color wherever the oxygen is present that gives the red color. So, if we notice uh, these three uh, images carefully what we see that almost wherever this bright brighter uh, contrast is there in those places both green color coding and red color are present except that this uh, um, circular mark which are uh, uh, except that few places where it is marked with circle like for example, here, here, here these are some particles and you see the green color is there, but no red color particles are there. So, these particles are showing presence of zinc, but absence of oxygen, but absence of oxygen. This indicates the particles inside this sample are not zinc oxide, they are only zinc, but on the other hand these lines which are zinc belt they are particularly both the, they are zinc oxide. These belt are zinc oxide, but the particles are only zinc. So, by uh, if we just do the elemental composition of a particular area that is normally uh, when we are doing with interaction volume it is al almost like the volume is approximately 1 micrometer cube. In that region our composition will be zinc, zinc composition is will be zinc plus zinc coming from the zinc oxide. So, zinc composition will be more in both in this sample. So, because of the presence of both zinc metal and zinc oxide. So, the uh, stoichiometry will not be maintained is to 1 is to 1 in this kind of sample, but now to know the distribution of distribution or presence of zinc metal the mapping is most suitable and this is what the example you see here how the mapping is helping to confirm the presence of zinc metal in the zinc oxide sample. And here is the spectra uh, this is collected from a region where there is a little bit of uh, less dense uh, material is present. So, here you see the particles type of particles and particles are there this is the P particles here and this is the belt region A. In the A region we could see the oxygen peak is quite stronger 
compared to the B region particle region which see oxygen percentage to be smaller indicates that this edge this is nothing but zinc oxide it has nothing but zinc. You may ask why still we see oxygen because uh, in uh, um, because the resolution of the EDX spatial resolution of EDX is on the interaction volume. So, even though we are trying to collect the information from this area, but as interaction volume is quite large information are also coming from here around around the point we are collecting data therefore, you see the oxygen peak here. So, this confirms that this belt are primarily zinc oxide on the other hand particles are zinc in uh, only zinc metal. So, this is about the EDS and uh, the limitation of the EDX are that uh, it cannot detect uh, it cannot detect uh, lighter atomic number elements below the boron and detector has to be preserved at a lower temperature at 77 Kelvin all the time to reduce the noise in the system. Energy resolution of the detector is poor, X-rays are not detected as a sharp lines, but typically with a uh, width of 125 to 150 uh, electron volt wide. In addition, under some circumstances spurious peaks comes that is some peak and silicon escape peak. Some peak is a peak uh, if the two photons if the two x rays two x rays arrive at the detector at the same time arrive at the detector at the same time then detector will see it as a one x rays and it will take the energy of both x rays it will add the x ray uh, energy of both rays for example it is 2 kev and it is 2 kev then detector if they simultaneously arriving then it will consider one x ray arrived of energy for kev this is got some peak if the x rays are arriving at this same time to the detector so now uh, and this happens more when the count rate is high when the count rate is greater than 10000 cycle per second cps then this type of problem may arise so in order to avoid formation of the sum peak one can reduce the count rate the count rate can be reduced by decreasing the incident beam energy and also the prop current normally the edx spectrum is collected with acceleration voltage of uh, acceleration voltage of around um, 15 to 20 uh, kb acceleration voltage e0 energy normally 15 to 20 kb if the count rate is too high then one can reduce the acceleration voltage so that some peak will not arise. The second thing is that silicon escape peak. Silicon escape peak we, we use silicon detector. We use silicon detector. So, so when X-ray energy falls on the detector, it can knock out a inner cell electron of silicon. So, for example, silicon um, it needs uh, to knock out a uh, K cell electron uh, K cell K alpha electron of silicon we need energy of 1.74 kV silicon. So, if the energy incoming X energy knock out an K al, uh, inert cell electron of silicon that incident energy will lose the energy of 1.74 kV. So, it is detector will measure the energy of X rays which is 1.75 lower to its original value and this is called silicon escape peak and this can also be uh, in this is more when count rate is very high. So, by decreasing the count rate we can decrease uh, reduce the sum peak formation of sum peak and silicon escape peak. This is about the limitation of uh, uh, EDS. So, now in conclusion what we see EDX provide the composition of the element boron onwards present in the specimen. The analysis time to obtain the composition by EDX is very fast it is less than a minute to couple of minutes and EDX mapping allows to find distribution of different phases in the specimen these are the important points of the EDX. Then we can discuss some other special technique of the SEM like we can uh, get crystallographic information from the SEM, we can also get specimen current detectors, magnetic contrast, voltage contrast, we can also do EBIC or electron beam induced current study 
and also cathodal illuminations can be done with as a other special techniques with SEM if uh, the appropriate detector is attached to the SEM. Now, let us first go to crystallographic information. We have previously discussed that uh, we, uh, in the SEM secondary and backscatter electrons are emerged. Secondary electrons yield or secondary electron coefficient increases with the tilt angle. On the other hand, the yield of backscattered electron or backscattered electron coefficient increases with atomic number. Not only the yield of backscattered electrons increases with atomic number, but also this yield changes with the orientation of the sample and crystallographic uh, structural factor of the sample. For example, a primary beam is incident on the sample here in the left side you see and if the crystal atoms are periodically arranged, then electron beam can penetrate more. In, in the left side that is what you see here, here electron beam can, can, can penetrate more. But in the middle, if the electron beam coming with a particular angle to the specimen, then what you see that they are not able to penetrate much deep, but rather they are getting diffracted. In the third cases, again electron beam coming from the top and then <coughs> backscattered electrons are diffract diffracted. So, this process can provide us crystallographic information. If we have a uh, amorphous sample, let us say if we have a amorphous sample, then in the amorphous sample atoms are arranged randomly. Therefore, diffraction will occur also randomly providing a specific uh, pattern. On the other hand, for a crystalline material where atoms are arranged periodically, there the diffraction will be uh, diffraction uh, will produce a specific pattern or a regular pattern and this will be much stronger diffraction and this diffraction will be much stronger when this satisfies the Brax condition this satisfies the Brax condition Brax condition is n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta b where theta b is the Brax angle and d is the atomic the spacing between atomic planes and lambda is the wavelength. So, when the Brax condition satisfies diffraction will occur. Now, we will see how it happens. Now, in order to achieve the Brax condition, in order to achieve the Brax condition, we uh, now, uh, electron beams H2 incident on the sample with a large angle or wide angle. So, uh, in our SEM electron beam scans from x to y direction in the raster manner. So, when electron beam is scanning from one side to other side automatically the angle of uh, electron beam to the specimen keeps on changing and keeps on changing. To make this angle much wider what can be done we could have we can have a larger uh, working distance, larger working distance that means distance between the electron beam to the specimen can be large and in this particular cases it, is, it can be as li large as 2 centimeter working distance. So, sample has to be large. So, it is let us say 10 x magnification and if we scan uh, um, in the 1 centimeter area then the beam, beam angle beam angle changes by 14 degree across the field. So, that would allow us to achieve the Brax condition for some planes. So, when this Brax condition is satisfied, then we could see a pattern forming, pattern forming uh, or a channeling pattern is will form. This is here you see a channeling pattern of a single crystal and polycrystal. In the left side, what you see a regular pattern of lines and uh, line and bands there is a brighter bands there is a darker lines a regular pattern that you see in the left side left side you see a regular pattern so this is from uh, a featureless flat silicon flat silicon crystal with one 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 planes so this is providing a regular pattern because diffraction or channeling is occurring in a specific manner when the Brax condition is satisfied. On the other hand, you see 
in the right side for a polycrystal. In the polycrystal you do not see a regular pattern as you have seen in the left side, but rather you see a contrast difference, brightness contrast. These are due to different grains, due to different grains, but as the grains are smaller when electron beam scan across this grain, when electron beam scan across the grain, they do not cover large angle, large wide angle, therefore Bragg's condition is not satisfied. As Bragg's condition is not satisfied, the, the specific or uh, regular pattern did not form in case of polycrystals. Moreover, moreover uh, this uh, channeling pattern, this channeling pattern uh, will provide the contrast difference for polycrystalline material that you have seen. Here it is a very clear uh, contrast difference uh, of electron channeling contrast from a polycrystalline sample. The left side was 14 and right side is nickel. Here as the electron beam scan angle is smaller, therefore we do not able to satisfy the Bragg's condition and that is showing, not showing the very um, regular channeling pattern, rather they are showing uh, the brightness contrast difference and the brightness contrast difference is also informing us about their different orientation and also telling us about the grain boundaries, about the grain boundaries. And we would like to measure, it, it is preferred to measure, to prefer to measure the uh, orientation of individual grain. It is preferred to measure that we could measure the orientation of the different grains which is not possible or which is not easy when the crystal size is very small within the channeling pattern. Now uh, in present days we do not no more use the channeling contrast or, um, or channeling pattern measurements for crystallographic anal analysis in the SCM. In the present days it has been shifted to uh, electron backscattered diffraction EBSD pattern. So, the EBSD pattern or electron backscatter diffraction pattern is primarily used for texture analysis. So, which provides us the crystal orientation in the specimen. It will do grain to grain basis that is providing local microstructure and also that is telling the crystal orientation of the each grain. It would also tell us about the uh, crystal, uh, crystal phase, it will also tell us about the crystal phase by measuring the crystallographic orientation or parameters such as crystal plane spacing, angle between the planes and crystal symmetry. Why it is important? In our X-ray analysis or EDX analysis, we know elemental composition. We know elemental composition. For example, we have a titanium oxide sample TiO2 with a ratio, atomic ratio of 1 is to 1, 1 is to 2, titanium 1, oxygen 2, 1 is to 2. So now my elemental composition or EDX measurement will tell me I have TiO2 with a ratio of 1 is to 2. Now X-ray analysis or EDX measurement will not tell me whether the TiO2 is an attach because TiO2 can exist in several phases such as an attach, rutile also brookite, di different phases it exists. Energy dispersive action analysis will not tell which phase is present, but if we could measure the crystal structure such as the plane spacing, angle between the plane and crystal symmetry, then we would able to tell which phase of TiO2 present in our specimen or if there is a mixed phase, then which grains are of an attached phase, which grain, grains are brookite phase. This, this is therefore very important for metallurgical uh, uh, metallurgy uh, uh, in analy analyzing the crystal orientation for geological sample. So, EBSD this is called electron backscatter diffraction which is something uh, which is nothing but little similar to the channeling pattern. In channeling pattern also we have diffraction, here also we have diffraction. The backscattered electrons which are diffracted from the specimen will provide a pattern and with from that pattern we would able to know the crystal phase of the specimen. 
uh, in in our next class we will in next lecture we will discuss on the electron backscattered diffraction pattern thank you